Well, it's Gary Kipun. It's Nathan here, aka the Rambling Kern, and head instructor of Kern School of Combat. So I wanted to address uh, an often asked and very misunderstood part of Irish stick fighting, which is why did the faction fights happen? So a lot of people kind of misinterpret the reasons as to why they happened, why they took place, and how they would even start in general. Um, and a lot of this comes due to essentially propaganda of the time, um, largely English, but also in some cases Irish, basically used as a method to dissuade people from taking place in faction fights. Now, I'm going to break this up into a series of videos to kind of go deeper into each of these separate topics. Um, and this is actually something that I've been researching for this video series for a few months now, but this won't be by any means an exhaustive list because it is quite a large topic spreading a few hundred years so i'm going to do my best to break it down into kind of bite-sized chunks to which you guys can understand but this initial video is to give you a bit of an overview as to why they happened why they didn't happen and kind of some of the things that we generally get wrong when we talk about them so first off it's kind of important to understand what a faction is in the first place um and why they formed so um i'm just going to be diving in there as notes as I discuss this. So one of the things that is kind of important to note with factions is generally the term and the way we use it today is actually quite indicative of what factions were at the time. So factions were generally formed along the lines of kin, confession, territory, occupation, or class. Now we see this, especially with the occupation, far more in the cities and sort of the factions that we encountered there. Um, such as one of my previous videos where we discussed in Dublin City you had weavers, so cloth weavers of various different types, um, and butchers um, in the Liberties who basically divided up into two very distinct factions at the time. This kind of came off the back of the breaking up of the guilds and there was kind of a power vacuum left and uh, as a result a lot of people took over um, and formed these factions. So kind of a very important thing to understand as to what factions were in a lot of areas i guess in a modern term you might describe them similar to a gang or kind of a mafia-esque style organization although that's not really appropriate you see in ireland at the time there wasn't many established police forces and generally the police forces were only in cities and even at that more often than not there was none and usually the form of justice that was delivered was delivered by the army and this was usually just violence to break up a violent protest um, there wasn't really day-to-day -day policing as we know it if you had a grievance you'd bring it in front of a judge um, and deal with it through the legal system however if you were poor generally these things might descend into um, a dispute or violence and so on so often what was done was any kind of semi-legal activity or anything like that was usually organized and conducted by these groups. So that's kind of important to understand as we start off. So a lot of the early factions themselves were as simple as just being family groups who kind of banded together in a certain area and to basically gain a little bit more power. Um, this can be seen throughout Irish history of one family having a feud with another and then their cousins or uh, you know, relatives on whatever side band together, this essentially becomes what we would consider a faction and then this develops from there. Then there becomes geographical factions. Often these were bands of men who would, like I described, you have a town that doesn't essentially have a police force, they would kind of act as the police force, the enforcers of such in the town. Um, and also sometimes looking after kind of semi-illegal activities, um, such as gambling, um, and various other activities like that. So this portrayal that we have of drunken um, stick fighters who basically drink a load of jars of beer and go out and bash each other's heads in is not in any way at all indicative of what faction fighters were and what faction fights were when they took place. Now obviously people did get drunk and fight, That's there's no, no one disputing that, but I think it's kind of important to understand that that was not the case. In fact, I'm going to reference a quote from Daniel O'Connell. So Daniel O'Connell was a very important figure in Irish history, and I will be touching on 
him and his impact on faction fights in one of the upcoming videos in this series but what he basically said was that he expressed concerns over faction fighting at the time that they usually had more to do with the image projected than the injuries or deaths resulting from the fights as long as the irish could be portrayed as drunken barbarians bashing each other for the fun uh, all economic or political hardships could be blamed on the irish character however even at its worst level of violence the violence in ireland was far less of that than in than that of england so you can see that faction fights were being used as a tool of suppression um, on the Irish. So portraying this image of the Irish faction fighter as a drunk out swinging his stick, not only is it incorrect, it was essentially a tool of suppression for the Irish people. So it's something that I have really worked to break, um, that stereotype that is placed upon faction fighters and the Irish people in general, especially when we come to talk about the fighting Irish. It's something that I take great pride in, and it's something that I believe Irish people should take great pride in. However, it's something that is very, very misrepresented for, as I said, for a myriad of reasons. So, to kind of break it down into the most simple points that I can, and each one of these is going to be um, getting its own video in due course, but I've essentially kind of broken this down into these main areas. So. You have the land clearings as a reason for faction fighting. The ties war, white footism, the essential need for recreational violence amongst the poor, and that this was used as a tool for preventing less controlled forms of violence taking place, basically as a way for settling disputes. So to touch on each one of these, so the clearings are quite an interesting thing in themselves and something that a lot of people don't really understand but essentially in Ireland you had a mostly agrarian society people who were actually able to just survive off the land with very little land and as a result you had landlords who didn't want to look after their tenants but also a severe issue where landlords wanted to get rid of these tenants and put in more profitable farm land or to basically get more money out of them so this quote here is from uh, George Cornwall Lewis now he was one of the bureaucrats who went on to create the uh, workhouse system uh, if you're not familiar with that I will touch on that in my video that I'll do on the clearings but anyway the direct quote from him he says um, he wishes to alter the mode of subsistence of the Irish peasant to change him from the cottier living upon the land to a labourer living upon wages. To support him by employment for hire instead of by potato by ground. The change can only be effected by consolidating the present minute holdings and creating a class of capitalist cultivators who are able to pay wages to labourers instead of tilling their own land with the assistance of the grown-up member, members of their family. But landlords cannot consolidate farms because they cannot clear their estates. This period in the early 1800s is where we start to see the land clearings take place and this has a real snowball effect in Irish society because landlords wanted to get rid of the peasants off their land, replace it with cattle and make money from them. This, as 1800s progresses, really snowballs and set, the, sets about some pretty horrific things when the famine uh, takes place. And that kind of follows on with Whitefootism. So for anyone who's not familiar with Whitefootism, these were basically secret societies used to combat this. And many of these groups were factions who then became essentially secret societies who would then do what they can to help people both maintain their land, fight landlords, and fight the gangs that the landlords would then later establish in order to maintain their land and maintain their power on their area. So as you can see, factions and faction fighting was a far more complex thing than simply people getting drunk and fighting. And it's very much a period of Irish history that's very much ignored and is kind of the, the main reason why I'm making this video series. So the need for recreational violence is something as well that I think is something that kind of needs to be touched on. So at the time you have a, a large amount of political reform going on, such as the Catholic Association coming in, uh, 
And one of the things that we see is we have a very much a divide between what's going on politically in Ireland and what's going on um, for the poor peasant class. And now for mainly for the poor peasant class, they didn't really care about what's going on politically. That was kind of considered a middle class issue. For the poor, they just wanted to conduct their lives and enjoy themselves, as do most people, I guess. And one of the things that happened during the period was that recreational violence kind of it had always taken place but now it was getting more formalized and more ritualized and that's one of the things that we see with faction fighting so one of the things that's interesting to note as well and this kind of gives you a bit of a better idea as to how faction fights were when they took place um is this little description here so um a formal faction fight would sometimes involve hundreds of men each side and it would usually begin with the ritual of wheeling, which included chants, stylized gestures and insults. The traditional wheel included the name of the person or persons issuing the challenge, as well as the intended opponent. There are two recognized acts that signified the consent to the fight, the wheel or the removal of one's coat. While wheels uh, would include insults or references to past grievances, um, a challenge to see who the better man would be, would suffice or consent. So, again, these were quite ritualized in how they took place. And while they took place at a very wide variety of different venues and for a variety of different reasons, these weren't really these kind of mass brawls that they were presented as. They weren't these wild acts of violence. Um, sometimes they were, but generally, especially with the larger events, you're talking about a time where you didn't have very easy means of communication, so people would have to organize these events in time, which is, again, why they often took place at fairs, um, such as the ones that were very famous to have taken place at the Donnybrook Cattle Fair. Um, hence, we have the term the Donnybrook, and that is something that I will cover in a later video because we actually have a lot of very interesting references for what went on um, at Donnybrook. So, Just to kind of give you a quick overview again. So each of these topics I'll be doing a video on, but you have the clearings, the tithe war, white footism, recreational violence, or the need for it, and it being used as a tool to prevent more extreme violence from taking place. So like I discussed, the land clearings were taking place at the time. As a result of the back of this, there was a thing called the tithe war, which basically large tithes were being placed on the Irish people um, on all of the goods that they were producing and this led to a whole variety of uh, issues that happened later. Again, I will cover this in detail in its own video. The need for recreational violence, you're talking about a time where for the average person there wasn't really many sports as we know them. Often the sports that were being done were quite violent and it's also quite interesting to know that even during this time there was very few mortalities that were taking place during faction fights. In fact, in the city of Dublin, when two of the um, factions were going at each other, it wasn't until people actually began dying where the authorities began to combat it, because now they had a means to um, go after them, or go after the factions, basically round them up and um, uh, ship them off to the colonies. So people were actually quite careful to not um, essentially uh, kill anyone during these disputes. And one of the things actually I did forget to touch on this, but when we look at the numbers of people who are actually dying during these exchanges, there was a study done in the late 1800s, so this would have been after the, uh, after the famine itself, um, basically between 1866 and 1892, where 41% of all homicides outside of Dublin were through recreational violence. Now that doesn't just mean faction fights, that means um, boxing, wrestling, horse racing, a whole myriad of different things. So there was a very different uh, sensibility amongst uh, judges, jurors, and also those um, on the prosecution side 
and the aggrieved, I guess, um, as to their opinions on how and why um, deaths took place and, and what should be done about it. So, like I said, this is quite a large and complex issue and it's one that I have, as I said, studied for quite a while because I wanted to approach it in a very particular way because it's quite a sensitive issue and for those outside of Ireland, as you'll come to learn as the series progresses, there is a lot of cultural um, identity and politics wrapped up in this. There's a whole myriad of sectarian violence that went on at the time that still can be seen and the echoes of which can still be seen today that are also very important to address with this. And it's one of the reasons why I personally feel why this is ignored um, quite a bit in Irish history because it is in some ways quite a dark time and there was a lot of um, very difficult things that happened at the time that I think need to be dealt with in a sensitive manner. Um, so just to kind of summarise, I'll be doing a video on all of these different elements of factor fights and why and how they took place. But I just wanted to kind of address the overarching issue of no, they were not simply people getting drunk and fighting each other outside of pubs. Um, these were well-organized events with rules um, and very particular codes of conduct, that all of which happened for various different reasons. And I will be touching on those, as I say, in separate videos in this upcoming series. Now, I do hope you enjoyed that. Um, we're closing in on the 1,000 followers. As I've discussed, uh, when I do, uh, I do hope to start a bit of a Patreon, help to uh, raise a bit of funds for some future projects and planning. Um, some weapon tests and a few other little fun bits. Um, if you're interested in that or if you're interested in a class on um, battle act or Irish stick fighting, please do get in touch. Um, you'll be able to find all my details below and I really do appreciate the support. Once again, thank you very much for watching and slow.